Hello? Hello, is this recording? I believe it's recording. I think we're on and we're good to go. Let's save this. I think we're going. We are going. So I'm going to introduce it, Margaret, and then we're going to we'll go on. So my name is Tom Steam and University Archivist at St. Cloud State, and today's date is June 25th, 2019, and this is an oral history interview with my good friend, Margaret Voss. How are you today, Margaret? Doing super, Tom. I couldn't be happier if I was two people. Thanks for agreeing to uh, talk with us uh, on this oral history. So your, your voice will live on forever and ever I and love ever. it. I love it. So let's get started. We got, we got a lot to talk about. So, Margaret, you had many roles here at St. Cloud State University. You were a student. Yes. You were uh, an employee in many different areas, including Atwood Memorial Center, the, Student Life. The hub of the campus. The huh? hub, hub of the campus, hub. International Studies. Yeah. You did a lot. And now, in your retirement, we're wrapping up the sesquicentennial celebration, yeah. which will be ending in September. So Great been, birthday party coming up in the fall. I uh-huh. can't wait. So let, let's, let's start. Let me ask you some questions about your childhood. Where did you grow up, and how many siblings did you have, and what were the name of your parents? And yeah. I, I'm uh, really deep roots, Tom. Stearns County is uh, really home. My great-grandparents, both on my mother's side and father's side, both immigrated. Um, from Poland uh, to Stearns County. My parents, uh, Della Skodlarek, uh, Patrias was her maiden name, and my father, Frank Skodlarek, um, really met, kind of funny. My mother was a triplet born on Christmas Day, and my father, who was five years older than my mother, talked about growing up with people just amazed at these three perfect girls born on Christmas Day who all survived, which is very unheard of in 1915. So my father said he was infatuated with (laughs) meeting my mother already at a very early age. Um, So I grew up outside of Holdingford, um, heart of Stearns County, farm girl, um, raised dairy um, cattle on the farm. My father had just an eighth grade education, and there were eight of us. I'm the oldest of the second set of four. And my father, despite his eighth grade education, was adamant that all eight of us go on to school after high school. Uh, It was non-negotiable. And, uh, you know, he he was way beyond um, uh, his um, grade level when it came to intellect and curiosity. So he really uh, encouraged all of us to pursue um, whatever passion we had. So I went off to uh, Bemidji uh, because I visited the college up there in the middle of summer. And if you haven't been to Bemidji in the middle of summer, you should. It's worth the road trip because Lake Bemidji is absolutely gorgeous, sits right on the campus. And I thought, what an amazing place to go to school. Okay, so place, not so much program of study, though I really didn't know what I wanted to to be when I grew up. Um, Place was real important, except it started snowing about the 2nd of September, and it never stopped. When we would leave in June, there was still snow banks on the ground. I think ice finally went out on Lake Bemidji in July. And then, it, I, so it was the end of the world in my mind. I had friends that went to St. Cloud State, came down to visit them, and oh my word, the Performing Arts Center had just been built. And I walked into the auditorium, and it's like, oh my gosh, you have two stages? Actually, they have three stages in the Performing Arts Center. I was sold. I, I transferred my junior year. And it was really the perfect place for me to be. I, uh, I loved the university. My experiences were rich. Um, so I ended up graduating with a degree in speech communication, but an emphasis in mass comm and, and theater. Um, 
There was a while there I even played with the idea of uh, doing radio, you know, um, maybe television. Um, but I ended up going and uh, having a degree in education. Did you have that major when you arrived? Did you know what you so in Bemidji, you were at Bemidji for two years? Did you? There, I, I knew what I didn't want, okay? I knew I did not want to teach English, okay? And at Bemidji, that was your only teaching degree in the field. <clears throat> they had some coursework in speech communication, um, some coursework in theater. But there was not a major nor a minor. It had to be English. Mm -hmm. And though I I love um, literature and I love the the or the area um, to teach would be my passion would be speech communication theater mascot. So did you? Appear in any theater productions, Margaret? You know, I did. I did at Bemidji and, and knew that I was so much better directing and back of house. So all my productions as a theater major here at St. Cloud State, you had to. You had to it was a requirement of a, a major degree to um, work every production. So I worked every production my junior, senior year, Always back of house, though, um, and took directing classes and loved that part of it, which might have led me right into being <laughs> director of programming in Atwood uh, down the road. But who who knew? Who knew? So, but so you graduated. We're gonna, well, I'm going to get back to your experience at St. Cloud State as a student in just a minute. But you decided so you were going to teach. So it was still I don't want to say well in the early 70s. I mean, primarily teachers. They're teaching teachers here at St. Cloud State. So if you were mass comm and theater... Um, and speech comm. And speech comm. So you said you didn't want to teach English, but you were willing to teach those other... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. and it was like the best of all worlds. So down the road, there's a wonderful community called Foley. And I have a sister-in-law at that time who was teaching English, loved to teach English, came out of a faculty meeting where the principal announced that they needed to develop a new curriculum for their junior high. And he wanted the emphasis to be on, guess what? Speech communication, theater, mass comm. And my sister-in-law said, I immediately thought of you because in 1972, I don't know if you know these stats, but I, knowing you, Tom, you do, education was the number one degree at St. Cloud State. We had a ton, a plethora of teachers out there. So for any position that was available, there would be 100 to 500 applicants for that one job. Very competitive, very difficult. The field, very difficult. Um, but I filled out an application, got an interview at Foley, and said, listen, I'm willing to write curriculum. I'm willing to teach. And boom, they hired me um, in January of 1973, and I ended up teaching in Foley until 86. Wow. Yeah. A teacher for 14 years. Yeah, about 13. 13 mm -hmm. years. So I'm going to get back to the just, I'll get back to the teaching in just a second. Okay. So, so what was life like here at St. Cloud State? So you were here, so you arrived in 1970 to yeah. 72. Yeah. So... Considering what those electric. times were. It was yeah. electric, Tom. Um, what I remember is Vietnam War, okay, um, was alive and well. Um, we had just gone through the lottery. So I had many friends whose, unfortunately, their number was called. And we literally would all be around the TV watching the lottery happen. So we have a war that's going on, escalating. Okay. We have an environment that's a, a crisis. So when I got to this campus, that movement of environment and anti-war movement was alive and well, very strong. So there were many peace protests, and they were called that, peace marches. Um, and I know you have some photos from that era. Um, it usually combined music um, and speeches. 
And we would march, and we would march around campus sometimes. Sometimes we'd march down to Lake George. Sometimes it was to the federal building. But it was sending a message that the body bags that were coming back for, and it was not ever declared a war. Um, you know, it was a, um, there was a name for it, not a scrimmage, but a police action. Police action. I mean, Vietnam was a very strange period of time. So you had a very active campus um, body, you know, uh, student body, uh, very active. Uh, malls, you know, the mall would be full of students, um, you know, the protest of the week kind of thing. But really the focus was ending the war in Vietnam um, and cleaning up our environment. Uh, so I was involved with those groups. I certainly, as I said, because of being a theater major, major involved with every theater mm-hmm. production. But we also had um, Reader's Theater. Okay, and uh, I was selected to be part of a troupe. And what we would do is travel to elementary schools in northern Minnesota and perform mm, works of Dr. Seuss. And Reader's Theater is kind of fun because you don't need a stage. All you need is your voice. And uh, so there were six of us in the troupe. And so I really got to see kind of the elementary school systems, how they functioned and worked as we would kind of tour. And sometimes we'd go out only for like two or three days. Um, And I'm thinking, well, did I miss class those days or was it during spring break? I don't remember that part of it. Uh, But just that, oh, man, this was exciting. Um, And the troupe was a very eclectic group of students that, uh, again, not my friends selected because we were going to do this, but became really dear friends in that process. Wow. So campus was electric. You were obviously involved in in a lot that was going on. And and you were sort of at the tail end of St. Cloud State, well, transforming from a teacher's college to a college, and then in 1975, a university, and, and seeing what this Probably well when you arrived in 1970, there wasn't as much physical change as, a, as it had been happening the previous 10 years, but but this campus certainly had expanded a great deal. And, and, and you saw the homes that were here, that used to be here on campus, and, and how campuses replaced those, oh. those neighborhoods. Yeah, the, the university was in really transformational, you know, it was like um, the building of the year almost mm-hmm. for that period of time. So... When I arrived in 70, almost all the buildings, well, it's a good one, Tom. I I have to think about this. Third Street, Third Avenue South, that was sort of the border. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. you know, I want to say the mall was put in in, in, what, 74? 74, yeah. In 74, Centennial was built. Opened in 71. In 71. So So that happened while I was here. You know, the moving of the library Mm -hmm. from Kiel over to Centennial was pretty exciting stuff. Um, No, it was a very, you know, 10,000 students strong. Um, It was a, we were bursting at the seams uh, because for a long time we were more in that four to 5,000. And then um, we were full. Did you? Full. Did you spend a lot of time in Atwood? Do you know what Atwood was just finishing? Um, you know, we they had built the first phase, oh, so certainly spent a lot of time there. But it really was that second phase, third phase, and well, now I think we're in the twelfth phase mm-hmm. of Atwood that allowed that more of that lounge space community gathering space. So certainly I did. But I was really busy over in the theater department. So Performing Arts Center was really where I spent my time. My roommates spent a ton of time in Atwood, especially at the coffee shop. So, you know, it was their favorite place. Did you have some, so speaking, and I've heard people involved with speech communication theater, especially when I talked to Roland Fisher yesterday, and there's others I've talked about. Were there faculty members that that were mentors to you that, that helped guide what you became later on? Hmm. It, certainly. Certainly. Uh, you know, the one person I really think about is Dr. Don Sickink, mm-hmm. um, who then, um, you know, was a faculty member, but then became, you know, chair of the department. If I'm not mistaken, Dean. 
Oh, he played so many different uh, and roles. Yeah, uh, you know, he may be uh, that uh, Don Sicking or Barb Grochik, I think, had the most jobs mm-hmm. on this campus. But then um, I thought became uh, provost for a period of time or at that time vice president of academic affairs. He, he was in many different roles, um, but uh, Dr. Sicking um, was brilliant, brilliant educator. Um, I had some great professors in mass comm, and now you're really tapping my brain here, Tom, to to tap. Uh, but Volkers, um, Mill and, uh, and Mill and Fran, Fran yeah. you know, actually wrote the book mm-hmm. on on mass comm. Now, at that time, we did not have the studio space that KVSC has today, which is fantastic. UTVS uh, was <laughs> was almost like in the in the basement area, kind of this back room area. So the facilities we have today for MassCom is, you know, state of the art, mm-hmm. awesome facilities. That was not quite the way it was be- back in the day, um, but we had fantastic uh, professors. I thought who were at the top of the field, and when your textbook or your teaching materials is published and used by many, many people across the country, I think it says something about the quality of education at this institution. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to your to your teaching career. So 1973, January 73, you are at Foley High School. Foley? No. Well, it was high school, and high school was 7 through 12. 7 through 12. Mm-hmm. And I taught 8th grade. So... It was crazy times, Tom, because I was writing the curriculum, and that's why I come back to <clears throat> Don Simp- Sicking, Dr. Swanson, Dale Swanson was also real important folks because I would be on campus every week saying, okay, what do you guys think about this idea? You know, is this crazy or should I? And then, boom, go back, and uh, you had to turn in your lesson plans a week ahead of time. So literally, I was working two weeks out on the curriculum, teaching six classes a day, okay, and uh, having the time of my life. I knew that uh, being in the classroom um, was the place to be. I also discovered that probably eighth graders was not the crew that I really, wow, they are high energy. But the other thing about eighth graders, it's a whole spectrum of maturity levels. So in eighth grade, you have some students that still are kind of fifth graders. And you have other eighth graders that are really freshmen in college. And you try to teach to all. You know, and back in the day, we didn't have class limits. So I'd have 32 students uh, fill every chair. Um, Yeah, it was was crazy times. And yet, um, we did it because... They then turned around and hired me the next year, and the next year, and the third year moved me into the senior high. And again, we, my master's, I was taking my, uh, my master's here at St. Cloud State at the same time. So I was working on my master's in curriculum development. So I really love that idea of trying to look at how do we, <clears throat> what's our goals, what's our outcomes, how do we get there? So I helped write um, the curriculum for the senior high that I, some parts of it still exists today, and that's a long time ago, 30, 40, 40 years, years ago, a long time ago. So you're teaching at Foley, yeah. and you, you get to the senior high school, and I know you came back. We've talked about this before, so 1981. You 80. Are 80. Actually, 80 I came back. Um, so what? So you yeah. so you're, you're a teacher and I'm now... a teacher. I'm a chief negotiator for our union contract. Okay, and it was tough times um, in contract negotiations. We had taken a strike vote, and the strike vote failed, but only by a few votes. Well, you never want a strike vote to ever happen to begin with. Going on strike is not the ideal thing to do, but that's the situation we were in. I came home from that meeting. People were just on all sides. No one's happy, right? Um, And a friend called and said, you know what? You um, are eligible to apply for a sabbatical. 
maybe this is the time next year that you finish your master's because, you, you know, when you're teaching full time, I could only take one class a quarter, mm-hmm. right? In the summer, you load up, um, but it was truly just pecking away at my master's degree. And within three weeks, I had my sabbatical uh, approved. I had a grad assistantship. And guess where that was at? At Wood Center in Programming. And that started a whole new world for me. Um, I was introduced to the Atwood family. Um, I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, it was, we worked as a team. We worked uh, community, student-based. And um, we programmed, um, put on events. And back in that day of the early 80s, we would do between 300 to 350 events a year. So we constantly had, um, every week, um, a, a whole series of events. So it was a regular music, weekly music series, certainly a film um, series, lectures. We had um, art gallery that we filled with um, wonderful juried shows. I, it was a very, very busy place. Um, so I was here for one year. And I was to go back as and a teach. graduate assistant. A grad assistantship. Go back to teach yep. As a UPB. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then again, I feel like my life has been timing. I'm at the <clears throat> right place at the right time with the right need. And I'm crazy enough. And I'm supported by a husband who says, well, why not? Well, I mean, why not? All you can do is ask. So I'm asked to consider being the interim director of the university program board for the next year. And I'm like, no, I can't. I have a contract. I need to go back to Foley. Well, why don't you just ask? Ask the school board. I just ran into the chair of the school board last week, and I'm like, you know, you changed my life in so many ways by saying yes to me. And he said, I don't think we ever could say no to you. (laughs) But now, they did, though. They did. I do remember times they said no. But anyway, so I was granted one more year of leave from Foley and then served as the interim director of, of UPB, of the University Program Board. So it was just sort of seamless. I, did, I didn't realize that you had, you had done a year as a graduate assistant, Correct. so it wasn't just, I just didn't know. Out of the blue, yeah. Out of the blue. No, you were, you were there, and you were obviously very capable, and they asked you to do another year. So, so, you, did the, so you did another year filling in for Pat Kruger. Pat Kruger, who was just amazing. But her line was, you know, I need to take a sabbatical. I need to just take and look at the world a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And that's what really sabbaticals do, is it really kind of forces you, in a way, to reflect on what you've done, but really, at the moment, where do you want to go next? And um, and it's filled usually with great classes and uh, challenging professors and people in your life who really are always asking that question. You know why? So, so I, what? So what kind of effect did that have on you for that that single year as an interim director? Did you decide that you're like? Maybe I shouldn't teach anymore or, or what? <laughs> no. You know what? I was so pumped about going back into my classroom because, remember, I finished m- my degree. So I'm in class now full time. When you're a grad assistant, you work 20 plus hours a week. But but you can take a full load um, of classes and your schedule works around. So I was able to finish my degree. I had all these great ideas. Um, again, I thought my professors in the, you know, um, education department, particularly Dr. Mortrude, there was two doc- brothers, <laughs> the Mortrudes, were outstanding. Again, about teaching methods, methodology, um, curriculum development. So I really wanted to get back to Foley. So I head back to Foley. I teach for four years. But to be honest, Tom, my heart was here. I, you know, I love teaching. I love teaching. And fortunately, when I was hired in, back in, eight, in 86 to be the director of programming, I could teach. So I taught classes, uh, adjunct professor, 
usually one a year. I, I just would never want to leave that classroom behind. But working in leadership with university program board, student government, I'm all, all, we're always teaching um, leadership classes, uh, either one-on-one -on -one or actually going away for a retreat or workshops or that type of thing. So it never, um, yeah, it's never really left me, that, that teaching part of my life. So 1986, you're back. I'm so, back. So someone must have, did Pat leave UPB or was um, it somebody else? Yeah, so Pat never came back to UPB. Oh. Do you know, when she took her one year, she ended up going into admissions and was our uh, associate director of admissions and then I, uh, interim director of admissions at Sinclair State, I want to say for almost 15, maybe mm -hmm. 20 years, a, a long lengthy period of time, okay? So um, Brent Green is who they hired, and um, he left. The director of Atwood, Joe Basil, also left. So within a week of one another, uh, Joe Opatz, or I was hired as the director of university programming, and then Joe Opatz was hired as the director of Atwood. So the two of us came in, um, both both Huskies. Both of us had degrees from St. Cloud State um, and really were just excited about, yeah, what could, just think about our potential. What's our opportunities out there? So what kind of vision did you have for UPB? <clears throat> Since you, you were there essentially two years, was it more of, we'll just continue what it, what's been going on? Pat, or, yeah. Or well, it's, <clears throat> I've got some other ideas and, and yeah. this is the way we're going to go. I'll tell you, though, Pat Kruger and those that worked with, it was two programming committees called ABOG, Atwood Board of Governors, and the Major Events Council. Okay, these are two separate bar, uh, programming entities, and the decision was made in the late 70s to join them together. And Pat and her team at the time, I thought, just did a fantastic job of building a foundation that was solid. And the programming you know, vision was that to educate is always at the bottom of all that we did. You know, and you might be educating by what it would take to put on this particular event, to educating by bringing a profound speaker or musical artist or dance troupe uh, to the university uh, community. Um, we had a, a vibrant um, budget, and we had a large programming body. So there were 12 programming chairs, but each of them had committees, some committees as many as 50 students who'd show up every week to debate and challenge one another about what the next major concert should be or the next major speaker. Um, it's really the students who were the core of the university program board. The director and staff, we helped facilitate, but it really was what the students wanted to bring to their campus um, that made it very exciting and vibrant. So vision for me was how do I help facilitate uh, what it is that the students um, dream about um, and, and find that these realities, you know, can happen, actually happen. Um, and we did a lot of training. Uh, we were always in training mode about decision making marketing, how to be the best um, communicator within that committee so that you could facilitate decision making. Uh, because we cranked out a lot of events, we did. And what do you think the uh, impact was on those students at the program board as well as the students on campus yeah. as just a, yeah. someone who would attend? Yeah. You know what? I, I think about those students, those programming students, those university program board students. It was life-changing for them, and I know that firsthand. For some of them, they actually changed their career choice, you know? They were going to do... A, and they ended up actually becoming staff at universities across this country. We have a very strong network of alum from St. Cloud State 
who are at universities across America, around the world, actually. And uh, they point back to sitting in those board meetings, um, making decisions, um, having a vision, having a goal, having a dream, and, and what it takes. And it, usually it's hard work, a yeah. lot of hard work uh, to make things happen. I think for this campus population, I, I can judge their um, appreciation, first and foremost, by attendance. You know, when you have sold-out houses, when you have um, waiting lines, when you have to do um, uh, a second venue where back in those days, you know, this is way before our high-tech ability today, but it took a lot to set up coaxial so we could actually take an event um, from Hallenbeck and pipe it over to Ritchie Auditorium uh, because that was the only way we could really experience things and see things. So I, I'd have to look at their attendance at events. Uh, it was strong. They were very involved and enthusiastic. Um, and, and also the funding uh, because all the programming we did was based from student fees. Students elected um, to give us a budget uh, in order to do the programming that we did. So, oh, I've just lost my train of thought. Um, the impact, so the university isn't just a place, this is something that we heard recently from, a, from an administrator, it isn't just the classroom. This is, so you're, you've got these students who are doing this work at UPB, making real decisions with real money, right. with real consequences. So That's this right. isn't something they, they may have read in a book, but this is, this is real life, really. And to have that, to me, it's, it's strong to have that, you have that academic experience, but then you have some real life experience with real consequences and real money that, that is invaluable. Exactly right. Now, um, particularly, I can think we had a series of speaker coordinators. So we had a speakers series, okay? And what they wanted at that time, um, the abortion debate was, you know, Ro Roe versus Wade passed, but it was only, what, I think Roe versus Wade passed in 70? Somewhere 70, 72, 73. Maybe 73. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so we're in the late 80s, and it's still being debated. So we started what we didn't know at the time what we were starting, but was a debate series on this campus. So we were going to take hot topics, hot, and bring the experts on that topic and debate. So our first was abortion. And we brought in the attorney that argued Roe versus Wade, Sarah Weddington, and she went against Phyllis Shafley, an interesting woman, has her law degree, but really felt that uh, government should control a woman's reproductive rights, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can understand the place sold out. Tickets, it was the hottest ticket in town. We didn't back in those days, have the ability to do a broadcast. But it was such a hmm, excellent debate because it was based truly on two separate worlds of beliefs by two people who were extremely articulate and could argue, well, what that caused is our students, again, questioning, why is it that I think the way I think? And maybe there is another way to think about it. I'd always thought it was this. Well, I always thought it was that. And this really challenging, I think, the very core um, hmm, beliefs that we have as a child, that part of being an intellect or a part of being in an environment of intellect is that we, we start questioning not necessarily maybe changing our mind at the end of the day, but maybe we do, and it's okay. It's okay. But that became then a whole series. So I, I was trying to, uh, there was one called the mind, 
the state, state of, of the, the mind, mind versus mind of the state. And we brought in G. Gordon Liddy, who was back from Nixon days, and his big, you know, quote was um, he lighting a, a, a lighter and holding his hand over the flame and saying, they'll never get me to talk, right? You know, it's just, wow. G. Gordon Liddy, Watergate, look him up. He <laughs> debated Timothy Leary. And Dr. Leary was big into doing research on psychedelic drugs in California. So the two of them, I, I had the most amazing lunch at the Kelly Inn, of all places, of St. Cloud, with Timothy Leary and G. Gordon Liddy. And I got to tell you, Tom, they were from opposite planets in so many ways. But there was a real mutual respect of one another um, that we just had the most delightful two-hour lunch. And it was kind of a give and take, both extremely brilliant human beings. Um, but it was, I can agree to disagree. You know, I, I, I don't believe in the legalization of marijuana. I don't believe in you know, psychedelic drugs, G. Gordon Liddy's take on it. And, of course, Timothy Leary is like, why not? You know, drop in, drop out kind of attitude. No, we had uh, a, a whole series. I think we did those debates for about four or five years mm -hmm. in a row. So what are the memorable events went on during your time as director of UPB, and, and what kind of interactions did you have with these folks? I mean, obviously, they're on campus to entertain, to educate, and to broaden the student's mind, which I think is absolutely critical, especially for folks who have different viewpoints. But to be able to be exposed to these kinds of uh, uh, folks in central Minnesota that you may not be exposed to anywhere yeah. else? Yeah, you know, really, at that time, I think we always were referred to as the flyover zone, right? Mm -hmm. It's either East Coast or the West Coast. It's certainly not Minnesota uh, for folks to come in. You know, there's a lot, Tom, and I know we only have so many hours to, to visit, but the one that really pops is uh, we had, again, a speaker uh, committee who very much up on what's going on in the world. And Spike Lee was this up-and-coming film director who uh, had just made another movie, and this one was called Do the Right Thing. And one of the students in the speaker's committee said, I just read something that he wants to go to colleges and, you know, gymnasiums to talk about the importance of, first of all, um, directing and the message that the film industry can have and really formulating our minds, our um, our direction, our culture, okay? And then his second aspect was he really wanted to talk about doing the right thing. And what is that thing, okay? And it's like, whoa, come on, Spike Lee, really, Minnesota? Well, let's try. So that really, and it, it would be a student on the phone with New York. We had certain agencies, particularly in New York and L.A., that we would call and say, here's what we heard. So his timing was perfect. Um, William Morris was the agency out of New York, and they're like, man, you people are right on top of this. Yeah, Spike just said that. We're just starting to set up the schedule. We want him. We want him in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I don't even know if he knows where that Minnesota is, but, you know, joke about really coming to the heart uh, of America in a way. So Spike Lee agrees. He says yes, and he comes to our campus um, we knew that it was going to be a um, standing room only crowd. Um, he was at Hallenbeck. We, did, we put him in Hallenbeck. We could put 5,000 um, in Hallenbeck for Spike. Um, we still had thousands of people wanting tickets, you know, the week out. So we negotiated to do the first ever of our coaxial run. Of cables, so we could broadcast Spike Lee to people in Ritchie Auditorium. Not the same, but at least they could hear him speak because, again, didn't have the ability or the right to do a replay 
Um, it was the capability to do it. So Spike Lee shows up, you know, and, and one of the things we always negotiated in, whoever it was, whoever the talent to come to campus, they had to have dinner with our students. Mm -hmm. That was a requirement because we felt that over uh, a meal, you can truly have a whole different conversation than you would from that podium. And these students, volunteers, worked really hard in promoting the event and making the event happen. So anyway, Spike Lee walks into Helen Beck, and he looks around, and he sees the coaxial cables that it took uh, UTVS crew, students, eight hours to string. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's 4 o'clock now. We're getting ready to do sound check. And he said, what's that? And I'm like, you know what that is. Those are coaxial cables. We're doing a broadcast to our auditorium across campus. He said, take it down. Mm. Nope, we're not taking that down. I said, I said, take it down. And I said, Mr. Lee, I have a contract here that says you've agreed to this. And he said, um, get me my car. Ew. So I have a sold-out house. I ha we have people in Ritchie Auditorium. I have eight hours of coaxial cable, and Spike Lee's going to fly back to New York. Yeah. So um, I said, well, how about if I take you to your green room, which is really just <clears throat> you know, one of the conference rooms in Helen Beck, but the students had set it up, so it felt very comfortable. There's furniture in there. Okay. And uh, I said... Um, I'm going to make some phone calls. Back in the days, no cell phones. I have to make some phone calls. But I said, why don't you relax? We had all his favorite things in his green room. And I come back to him, and I talked to his agent, and he said, um, yikes. What do you mean, yikes? He said, well, he did sign it, but he also has the right to break it. And that means we're in court for the next five years, and I, you got to figure this out you got to figure this out. So I decided that he probably had a headache. So <clears throat> I go into his green room, and he says, is my car here? And I said, no, um, but I have some aspirin. And uh, I said, I'm taking that you probably have a headache. And he goes, who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm just the woman who's trying to get a show on the road. Okay, that's all. I said, now let me explain to you about the coaxial. And I go on to say, sir, you are loved in this community, or at least have piqued the interest of a lot of people. We have 6,000 tickets floating out there for you tonight. You can get in your car, you can go back to New York, but you know what? You've sent a message. And I said, your movie, Do the Right Thing, hasn't been released yet, but everyone's going to say when they see that movie here in St. Cloud, but he didn't do the right thing in St. Cloud. So... You want to get in your car, or do you want to take the aspirin, see if it works, and I'll be back in 10 minutes? And he just, I, doesn't say anything, and I figure I am in such trouble. I leave, I come back, and he said, let's go. He was supposed to speak for one hour. He spoke for two and a half. He was supposed to meet with a group of students from, um, I have to think about the name of the group, uh, it was an African-American group of students that we had set up in, and they had a cultural center over in the education building. So we set up a meet and greet. He was only supposed to do 15 minutes because then he had an early morning flight to catch, and so that was how the night was going to go. He stayed with those students till 2 in the morning. And I think for those students, it was magical that he spoke for two and a half hours, and you could hear a pin drop to a sold-out show in Halibut. It said so much about who Spike Lee, you know, and he just released now a new movie. It's been a long, long time. But he truly is a brilliant human being who had a headache when he came to St. Cloud, Minnesota. And students won't forget that, obviously. You oh, never forget that either. Well, how I mean, could he, you? He stepped up and did he the right did. thing. He really did do the right thing here in Helen Beck Hall. So UPB, you were there until 
1995? 90, well, Joe Opatz, as I mentioned, who is the director of Atwood, happened to get elected into the House of Representatives, which is pretty amazing stuff. So Joe would have to take a leave of absence from St. Cloud State to serve in the legislature. So for a period of time, I did both jobs. I ran Atwood and I ran UPB. And then in 96, um, Dr. Bess was the president of the university at the time. Um, uh, it, it's a lot to run two large organizations. Um, so I ended up being named director of Atwood after a national search and uh, stayed there really until I retired in 2013. Did you have aspirations to to be Atwood director? Was that something you pondered? Like, well, maybe one day that's something I'd like to do, or no, I'm really happy here at UPB. And I mean, what what was your career <clears throat> goals at that point? Were you were you thinking loftier than where you were? Not that there was anything wrong with being at UPB, but you were thinking. Do you know what, Tom? I think um, so. Programming it, it's crazy hours. Okay, it's nights and weeks weekends. Um, and again, when you're doing 300 events a year, 350 events in a year, um, it was um, seven days a week, go, go, go. <clears throat> I think there was a point in time when I was thinking about what would life be like on the dark side <laughs> being administration and not so directly involved with students. Because when you're working with students, you're also there for them whenever they need you. And sometimes... It's at all hours of the night as well. Um, so I do think I, there was a point of going, you know, it would be certainly still involved with students. Um, so when I was asked that first time to serve as interim, um, it was, again, right time, right place, perfect opportunity to just try it out. W what does it feel like? Um, it feels okay. And in fact, as director of Atwood, I actually could control some things that would make the programming life a little bit easier, better, more efficient. Um, and then when it became a permanent position, I always felt that um, I still got to know the students, you know, that, that they are the reason at what exists to this day. It's, it's the students. It's their building. They own that building. Um, they are employed in that building, and uh, it, it really is a place where opportunities um, are, exist in every corner, in every aspect. So you were there from 96 to 2013, and I know we'll get to, you had some breaks in there as well, but but let me ask you this, what, and it's sort of a two-part question, what was your, what was your best accomplishment or biggest accomplishment while you were at Atwood, and what was... I don't want to say disappointment, but something that, that, or the biggest challenge that you had in those almost 20 years that you were there. Hmm. Boy, Tom, I, um, I should have been ready for this one. Um, I don't, I, there wasn't one when it comes to moments of great pride. I, I was so fortunate. Um, this is true in UPB, certainly true uh, as director of Atwood. I was surrounded by a staff that loved their jobs and were passionate about doing the work um, of the university. So um, we had employees in Atwood that were there for 42 years. Um, the accomplishment is that we, we as that, team in Atwood made it um, worthy, that it, it was worth coming to work every day, um, that every job was critical. There, there was no hierarchy of jobs to say, well, we had a program called the BA a, a pr program, and it's building assistance. Uh, that job was basically helping clean garbage, mm -hmm. pick up garbage, clean bathrooms, make sure there, there's no spills on the floor. I mean, they floated around the building and they did um, such a critical job mm -hmm. for how the building felt, okay? 
And so there was no hierarchy. No job, one job was more important than the other because they all went up. Oh, I think of, uh, you know, yeah, about 150 employees is what it takes to run Atwood, and um, 120 of it, 110, are student employees, you know. And so um, it was maybe that team of, of doing things. Disappointment, you know, um, Dr. Potter, uh, president of the university for t- eight years, nine eight years, years, yeah, almost. Yeah, I was going to say 10, but not quite. Not quite. So maybe eight or not. Dr. Potter always felt that Atwood could be more, that it felt very compartmentalized and in some ways felt cold, that, that what would happen if we let in more light? What would happen if we expanded some things? So he had students dream big, and oh my, did they ever dream big. So the... Again, it came from students. Um, we worked through with um, architects, uh, the Atwood for really the 21st century, and then and then some. And it was really to do, take a, and add light to that building, and um, add on to the building. So we would be connected to Ritchie to Stuart Hall, so that you could walk along this walkway all around campus. It had a hefty price tag. Um, I want to say $27 million price tag. And it was a lot of work the students put in in planning that out. But it went to vote, student body vote, and it was voted down. You know, uh, 60% to 40%, you know, 58 and that was a heartbreak. That was a disappointment because we really wanted to change the way that building kind of looked and functioned. Instead, what we did was take what was money that was already existed in our repair and refurbishment fund, it's called an r and and took some other dollars and did what you see today in Atwood. We literally blew up the inside of the building, uh, put in a fireplace, put in meeting areas for students to really gather and see outside, see sunlight, and be seen, and be seen. That see and be seen is a really important part. So that one, disappointment that the bond failed, but that's the way it is. It's the students speak. It's the students' voice. But then to be able to come back much, much smaller scale but still take those core values of letting light into the building, having students work together, sometimes spontaneously, in an environment that's very welcoming because all are welcomed at Atwood, you know. So speaking of opportunities, and and I know I said we'd we'd get back to this when we get to this, so not only were you Atwood director, you were also twice um, was it associate vice president for international studies. So you took some time off. Well, one in the middle of your Atwood tenure, and then when you retired in 2013. Yeah, but, they uh, brought me back. So, so again, was that another opportunity that 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 you thought about, or did someone approach you about <laughs> it, or yeah. or how did that come about? I mean, you were you were gone for two years, and then you had another role as as interim vice president for student development, student life and development. So that happened first, Tom. Um, So we had a vice president, um, Dr. Church, Nathan Church, retired in August, okay? And so the university asked the uh, uh, associate vice president of student life, Bernadette Wilson, to serve in that capacity as vice president. And by mid-year, actually, I think now about one month into it, Bernadette called me in the office and said, listen, this is, you know, I, I really liked being associate vice president, but I really don't care to be vice president. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can make it a full year. And the deal was she was going to serve as interim vice president for one year. Um, I believe it was by November, (laughs) she was really ready to just go out the door. And 
called me in the office one day and said, can I appoint you vice president? And I said, no, you cannot. You cannot. That's not your job. It's president's role. Fine. Dr. Saigo will appoint you vice president, but I'm just warning you it's going to happen because you need to be in this role. So starting January 1, um, I stepped in as vice president of student life and development for six months. Oh, it's an all. Oh, it's an amazing um, opportunity, but oh, no one has any idea all that takes place within student life because at that time we had about mm, 18,000 students, um, very vibrant um, campus community, no doubt about that. Um, but within, I don't know that it was two weeks of my appointment, we had a student go missing. Mm -hmm. And um, Scott Radel, um, wonderful student out with friends, um, doesn't come back home that night. And in, it took us three months um, to find Scott. But because he was one of ours, he was one of our students, my role as vice president was to be that voice of the campus community. Um, but I, I learned something at... Um, probably in my Atwood days, that you can't do anything alone. There's nothing, really, you can accomplish alone. You need a village. You need a team. So I reached out to Scott's family, and I had heard that they were, you know, at Perkins in the back room, um, and that was their station, their place where the police would give them daily updates and try to find out what in the world happened to their son because by all respects it felt like he vaporized. He was gone. Um, so I, I met with Mr. Radel and I certainly had the blessing of the University of Dr. Saigo that we would give him space in Atwood. That um, I would take one of my meeting rooms and just turn it into their place. And with that um, became this three-month-long relationship with the, the Radel family. Sad to say, um, they finally discovered um, that, that Scott had drowned um, in the Mississippi. And in March, um, using underwater cameras, because their family never, ever gave a hope finding him. You know, what happened to Scott? Um, wow, okay. And that's just certainly an example of student life. Um, it comes with good things, but it also comes with tragedies that one sometimes can't even imagine. And I was proud to say that um, the university was, was there for um, Scott's family and his friends um, to support them through what was really a very, very difficult uh, period of time. So, yeah, um, that role of vice president, as you're, you're you're um, an advocate for students, um, but that office also is the disciplinarian of, of students. It is the, the keeper of the rules, in a way, to make sure that this environment is a safe environment for all, that all, all students, faculty and staff um, can function. So you work very closely with public safety, you work very closely with the legal department. You work very closely with academic affairs. I mean, it is, you, you wear a lot of hats um, being a vice president. Did that make you want to continue in that role? Oh, gosh, or? no. It was the last thing I wanted to do. I mean, it was like, fine, I'll serve my six months. But this is a very special person that can continue to work that way. So I was so looking forward to going back to Atwood. But you did it. Because, yeah, life was pretty and beautiful and wonderful <laughs> and on the Atwood side of things. And Dr. Seigel called me into the office and said, I know you were thinking that you this was over, but I need you to go over and, and serve as Associate Vice President for International Studies. Um, it'll only be for six months, and uh, you can do anything for six months. You've proved that already, you know, being student life. And 
So again, my husband tends to be the kind of guy that would go, oh, why not? You know, why not? And we hired a large portion of international students in Atwood. Mm -hmm. That international program, in my mind, was a critical aspect of what makes this university unique, strong, vibrant, because all of a sudden we've taken a very isolated part of the country and brought in the world. Um, and at that time, I want to say we probably had 85 countries represented um, at St. Cloud State. I think our population at the time was maybe about 850 students, 900 students. So I said yes. Went over to international studies. Again, great team of folks. Um, failed search. Okay, do you mind going for another year? Oh, geez. Another failed search. And then it was a f full two years. Um, so that was very um, exciting again. Uh, the faculty at this university are absolutely the key to a strong international program. They have connections, passion about parts of the world that make it um, very vibrant for our students to go and study, um, uh, as well as for students from all over the world to come here. So, you know, during that period of time, South Africa just became this wonderful partner um, with us. And, you know, Shazada Maad and Robert Johnson, Dr. Johnson, uh, critical work in developing the relationship with Nelson Mandela Metro, um, still very strong to this day. You have Rob Lavenda, Dr. Lavenda, strong relationships uh, with Chile. We have a program down in the Concepcion at the University of Concepcion. Again, very vibrant, alive, but it's really because of the passion of our faculty and the connections and knowledge, awareness. Um, ANIC uh, continues uh, to this day to be the, you know, little jewel out there, mm -hmm. Harry, po you know, Harry Potter's <laughs> castle, right? It's been our castle for 42 years. Um, so to be able to see both sides, mm -hmm. uh, welcoming international students here and making sure that they have the tools to be successful, uh, as well as sending our students and faculty uh, abroad, um, again, to do global work that is critical. I, I don't care what your program of study is. Um, somehow we come back to we are not this small little island in Minnesota, you know, that we are connected. Minnesota particularly connected on all levels all over the world. Yeah, and educating students who come here from and making sure that their experiences. We're, I was talking to Roland Fisher about this yesterday making their experience, I'd say, worthwhile but meaningful for them, as well as in studying abroad and the connections that you make abroad are tremendous. Um, so 2008, you have, they have a new vice president over there. Did you, were, were you happy to go back to Atwood or were you like, you know, I don't I know. Could, I could stay over on the international <laughs> side. Well, I was really happy to go back to Atwood. Um I suppose um, I, it, I, um, the team of international studies was a good, solid team, but, you know, I just walked across the mall. I mean, it, you know, we were right there. Mm -hmm. So um, they were never very far away. And, and then it became, for me, how can I, within Atwood, really think of Atwood as uh, really home, away from home for these international students and what more can we do and really that development of those cultural events okay freeing up the ballroom making that a priority um, was such an easy thing to do and I think to this day they probably have 20 maybe it's 30 cultural events that highlight you name the country um, uh, they do it uh, in Atwood Center, and some, like Nepal, is so huge, they have to do it in two places, Ritchie Auditorium and Atwood Ballroom. But it, it really gave me, boy, a whole different level of understanding and empathy 
of how we can help support mm -hmm. what is truly a strong, strong initiative and makes this campus particularly very unique mm -hmm. uh, because we've been doing this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. This did not become popular in the last 10, 20 years. We've been doing this really since the, well, 70s, beginning of, yeah. well, international mm -hmm. students. Um, some would say oh. goes back to our 20s, right? Yeah, 1915. Yeah, the early 1915. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a strong, strong history and passion for thinking globally. So you, you're back at Atwood. Yeah. And when did you start thinking about, well, maybe this is... The end. The end. The end. Well, probably my husband retired. Um, and maybe it was like the thousandth time I walked out, because he had actually retired five years before me, uh, thousandth time that he said goodbye with a big smile on his face, and I'll have supper ready for you when you get home, that I just was struck by, I love my work. I really love my job. So to retire from it, wow, how do you retire from something you love? But then I really started thinking about um, other things I could do, right? The freedom to do other things. Um, letting someone else have the best job on campus, right? Because <laughs> that's the way I always thought of it. It really wasn't so much a job. They just paid me for having fun. Um, so, But it was that combination, my husband being retired for a period of time, and just going, you know what, I'll finish the renovation of Atwood. I'll finish this major project. Um, and then let the next person come in and, and take it from here. I don't know that I had really finished. I think I was retired five days, maybe ten. I don't know. And I get the call, right? Mm -hmm. Get the call. Mm -hmm. really, And I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, but I retired. And it's, yeah, but... Um, we'd like you really to come back and run international studies one more time. I did say no three times. <laughs> and, and they kept calling. <laughs> so I, lesson learned, Tom. Don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask the fourth time. So the fourth call, my husband goes, really? I mean, you loved doing that work as well. I mean, it's just for one year. Okay. And um, go for it. So I did. I, I said yes. So I started back on September 6th, uh, I think it was. Of 2013. Of 2013. So. And how did that year ago, Margaret? Well, Tom, it, it, you know, they always say you just never know what tomorrow holds, right? So I started on September 6th, which is kind of weird. I started on a Friday. And um, that following Wednesday, 9-11, um, I'm meeting with a, a, a fraternity. Um, and I'd had to deal with fraternities quite a bit <laughs> as student life vice president, uh, but also with that one as well. But I, I did not really know the new members of Delta Sigma Phi. Um, but they wanted me to shave my head to raise money for cancer. And my first, um, I really, I thought he, they wanted my checkbook. I thought what they were asking me to do was write a check um, for cancer research. And uh, instead, no, they thought it would be a really great idea, and it's called Shave for the Cure. And if I shave my head, wow, that would really raise a lot of money because they had settled, you know, $2,000. If we raise $2,000, you'll shave your head. Now... My office manager at the time had just finished her treatment of cancer. So I really wanted to touch base with Mary Pat on this to see, is this really a great idea or a really bad idea? You know, is it a gimmick? You know, the whole idea of shaving your head, if you go through chemo, the chances of you losing all your hair are pretty good, about 98%. So that we are having fun doing this, well, think about it. You're in chemo. So 
I wanted to vet this all out with Mary Pat. Told Delta Sigma Phi, come back in two weeks. I'll have my answer. Two hours later, Tom, uh, it's when I got the call, right? And all of a sudden, I'm in a hmm, whole nother world because I'm diagnosed. Stage four. 37 tumors throughout my body. Um, I think, well, I'm standing here today in front of you five and a half years later of a diagnosis that, hmm, some, yeah, many, um, um, healthy and, and cancer-free. I, uh, for some reason, the drugs are working, and the treatment that I'm still receiving to this day is really meant for my very aggressive type of cancer. So, in one hand, I thank forever after Delta Sigma Phi for um, <laughs> giving me this opportunity because my son goes, of course you'll shave your head because it's going to be inevitable. And uh, wear a pink wig. We'll get a pink wig. And so we're going to have fun with this. Uh, but ever to this very day, Delta Sigma Phi has been with me on my journey. Um, we raise awareness. Um, this university was more than kind to me um, in so many levels, in so many ways. Um, I never missed a day of work uh, from treatment. I was able to take time off when I received my chemo every three weeks because you're, you're really open to um, your immune system is zero, right? So you, you kind of need to be protected uh, in a way, stay away from folks. But um, it was the constant um, strength, I guess, that I felt from others, students, faculty, staff, that this community helped me fight the battle of my life, right? Um, so my oncologist, I said, do I need to quit work? He said, well, do you want to quit work? I said, I just started. But <laughs> no, I think I'd like to work. He said, well, then you should work. And that was the attitude with everything. Um, I was not able to travel, of course, internationally um, until I was totally done with chemo and the cancer was gone. And um, first trip was with a, a group of faculty down to visit our partners in Chile at the University of Concepcion, um, really putting forward some great, wonderful initiatives. And then, of course, I uh, uh, finally, officially, really, truly retired then, uh, June 30th, uh, 14. And what have you been doing for the last five years, Margaret? Well, I know you are still involved at the university. I am, Tom, because I love this place, okay? I'm crazy about St. Cloud State University. I am a husky down to my toes. Um, Dr. Potter had asked if I would join a brilliant team of folks uh, to work on our sesquicentennial Centennial Celebration, which will be September 15th, huh? Mm -hmm. of our fall coming up here, 2019. Uh, and uh, I would be that community chair or that volunteer chair. And so I get to work with Tom mm -hmm. and Terry Mishy and Lisa Foss at that time and Matt Andrew. And uh, we formed that core team. And then things changed. Uh, Lisa Foss went down to the chancellor's office. But the rest of us have been at mm -hmm. it. Um, really, Tom, it's four years that we've been working on this. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I just, this his, the history of this institution has never f changed from its very foundation, and that is to provide an opportunity, okay, um, to move this community and this world to excellence, right? That we never stop striving um, for how to be better, how to make life better, um, how to give back. And I think we've heard story upon story, um, especially you and your work with the archives or the history of our university, to find time and again people coming from very um, simple background, going on to be 
great and magnificent in, in so many ways. And it being a school teacher for 45 years and teaching second graders to read, to read, or, you know, being a CEO uh, of a Fortune 500 corporation, which we have many, to being on stage or being an actor, perform. I mean, our legacy here lives on. And I, I look at our students today who are today on campus registering uh, for fall classes, um, the, the, the sparkle in their eye of this is going to be my home for the next couple of years, four years, um, because my future is bright. There's so much opportunity. There's so much excellence. But that's really been our background for 150 mm -hmm. years. It was the very vision of Ira Moore, you know, our, our first well, president, president yeah. mm -hmm. you know, title mm -hmm. of president. Um, and, it, it, and it's true to, to this very day. That's why we are here. Our mission hasn't changed in 150 years, the impact marketing, that we make. Marketing yeah. has, packaging <laughs> has, but truly that, that those core values have have never wavered. Yeah. So let me ask you one more question. So about your family. So you've been married how long? Yeah, long, you know, is it I'm, a long time. A long. My mother, my mother had this great line. She was married fifty years, and my son is introducing her, her to his friend, and he goes, "Geez, Ben, meet my grandmother. She's been married fifty years." And Mary looks at Ben and goes, "You know, honey, some days it feels a lot longer than that." So, forty-six years this September. So wow. just celebrate our 45th. Wow. We have one son, um, Jacob, and he has married the most extraordinary woman, bar none. So she's my daughter in love, <clears throat> Annie. And they have two beautiful little daughters, Eleanor and Josephine. And I can't get out to Colorado enough to rock the babies in the Rockies. Huh? <laughs> That's great, Margaret. So, is there anything else that you want to mention and say? Something that we haven't missed, that we've missed, that, that we haven't talked about, that you want to talk about? And if not, that's okay. You know, Tom, I, I just, I think I've said it all, you know, that um, people, connections, um, opportunities— not being afraid to say yes um, has certainly been my path. And, and taking the advice of those much wiser than I. Um, I think sometimes we hesitate about giving advice to folks. But I can think about real critical times in my life that it was that voice of someone who I respected um, who said, you know, go for it. Try it. Take it. Go there. Lead with your heart, right? Lead with your heart. Use your head. Lead with your heart. Because um, at the end of the day, uh, that's all that really matters, right? Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Tom. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. It is my honor to interview you, and I'm glad you took the time to do it. So, Well, thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Thanks, Margaret. Thank I'm looking you. at